I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Matthew Adams, a principal lecturer at the School of Applied Social Science at the University of Brighton, UK. His new book is Anthropocene Psychology, Being Human in a More Than Human World. Previous books include Ecological Crisis, Sustainability, and the Psychosocial Subject, and Self and Social Change. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. You can follow him at Twitter at MattAdams0. That's M-A-T-T-A-D-A-M-S-0 at Twitter. Links also include his academia.edu page, ResearchGate, and a link to Brighton University, as well as a new article, Critical Psychologies and Climate Change in Current Opinion in Psychology, and a new commentary piece, Time to Make Nature Studies a Compulsory School Subject before it's too late in the conversation. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, available from Tripart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, tripart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You may also find this episode at YouTube at Trapart Film's YouTube channel. Just search for Trapart Film or Rendering Unconscious Podcast at YouTube. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, and sign up for my newsletter on the contact page to stay abreast of all upcoming events. You can also visit the Rendering Unconscious main website, renderingunconscious.org, and follow me at Instagram and Twitter at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Thank you so much for listening to Rendering Unconscious Podcast and for your support. You can support the podcast at our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Vanessa23carl. Your support is so appreciated. Thank you so much to all of our Patreon patrons. I guess a good place to start would be um, not at the beginning, but uh, my most recent book, Anthropocene Psychology. And I don't know whether you or or your viewers, listeners would know about this idea, this concept of the Anthropocene, whether we need to say something about that first, because it's in the title, you know. Let's say something about it. So, yeah, I mean, as an idea, I've been really taken by it. it's not been around for that long it, 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 around 2000 i think it was first used by a, i think it was an atmospheric scientist but then it was taken up by geologists um and what it basically means is it, it, it it's used to denote a period in earth's history um we know about scenes don't we when we think about the holocene perhaps uh and the anthropocene anthropos meaning human you you can you know where i'm going with this already the anthropocene is just this idea that it's simplest for the first time in the history of this planet uh and i'm smiling when i say it because it still blows my mind when i think about it uh so that's the 4.54 billion year history which is is just a phenomenal deep time anyway but that's roughly what how old geologists think the earth is Uh, for the first time in the history of that planet one species just one uh has become so dominant that it is shaping uh, the kind of the systems uh, which that that planet Earth relies upon to function, for want of a better word, uh, to survive and flourish, and that species is Anthropos or Homo sapiens, humans. Um, 
Yeah, so it's speculative geology in a way, in that it's geologists who have taken this up. And what they said that's really fascinating is it is some far future species that might want to look back, perhaps, we'll see in the sediment of the rocks, just like we do now, maybe only a half inch thick, um, but they'll see evidence of our dominance and that evidence will be in certain markers. And geologists are still debating it as they do, whether we can officially call this uh, uh, a scene, the Anthropocene, um, because of the markers that are left. And that's various things like plastic, mm -hmm. um, the fallout from uh, nuclear testing from around the 1950s onwards, but lots of debate now about what other things there might be. So um, bound up in colonial histories, those kinds of impacts, domestic chickens, the bones that are left behind by the mass consumptions of chickens today, again, blows my mind that on such a phenomenal scale mm -hmm. that um, it will be left as a marker. So anyway, that's the idea uh, of the Anthropocene. Um, and of course, once we start to take that on board, Seriously, Vanessa, it's got social, psychological uh, dimensions, right? Just trying to contemplate that on any level is, uh, well, it's an existential crisis, you could say, but it's certainly um, uh, something that encourages reflexivity on a kind of species level. So that's why you get people saying like, yes, the geologists might not be sure yet, or the atmospheric scientists, exactly what we call this or how far it goes back. But social scientists, cultural commentators, artists have been running with the Anthropocene idea for 20 odd years now. They, they, they're, they're, they're taking it. And um, there's all sorts of amazing work in and around that um, that concept. Yeah. So I think that's that, that's where I came to it as a kind of ambivalent psychologist. I thought this was a really good idea that we needed to engage with in my discipline. And my discipline kind of straddles psychology, social sciences humanities kind of in between I love that and I love the sense of awe and like expanse that you exhibit because I really think we we all need more of that because this is like amazing and awestrucking and like horrifying all at the same time but it also shows like what an impact we have had and are having and also I feel like a need that we need to kind of think about it and be more responsible <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that's it. You, I didn't get to that, but that's that's exactly what I'm, I'm thinking about, the importance of this concept. In some ways, it's important in terms of bearing witness to the uh, to what's going down. Yeah. To, to uh, another way of framing climate crisis and anthropogenic influences and how we need to sort that out. But also it's 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 an invitation, basically. Um, so, so although we're talking about profound impacts here, we are still talking about, uh, and uh, I, I love this term borrowed from a deep historian, we're talking about a parenthesis of infinitesimal brevity when we think about the Anthropocene. Um, so in the scale of things, you're absolutely right, it's about awe. In deep time, whatever we do, then uh, we, we are nothing, basically, mm. um, in terms of a species. But at the same time, we're having a massive uh, uh, unbelievable impact on other forms of life. So I see it as an invitation to start to engage with that sense of interdependence and interrelationality we have with other forms of life and other species. It, 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 for me, the Anthropocene isn't about hubris, about look how amazing we are, we now can name a scene after us. No, it's the opposite of that. It's look at the impact we are having. We need to step back and think about... Um, those interconnections that interdependencies as you said with a sense of awe and wonder anthropocene psychology <laughs> exactly yeah so yeah there's something about psychology uh, historically i don't know if it's because it kind of ended up on the coattails of um, uh, um the natural sciences and kind of went for that status but it tends to be slower in picking up what I think anyway. I think it tends to be slower often in picking up some of the more radical developments in social sciences and humanities and different ways of thinking, sometimes more resistant, sometimes ignoring them. Um, and not always, there's critical psychology and, and trans-species psychology and all sorts of psychology on the margins. But the, for me, the interesting work tends to happen on the margins. So I suppose in the book, what I did was um, I'd been reading 
lots of work from feminist, political ecology, post-humanities, and increasingly indigenous scholarship that again was blowing my mind in terms of running with the Anthropocene idea, sometimes explicitly, sometimes I thought it was implicit in what was being written. And when I say running with the idea, I mean, I suppose what, what at the heart of it is about extending a relational ontology. So it's extending the idea that who we are and what we are is always forever shaped by, uh, constituted by our relationships with others. And actually, I'd, I noticed that I'd written, been writing about that for a long time, most of my career, but I've been doing it in terms of people only. So thinking about development through theories like object relations theory, of course, or, or in interactionism, about how we come to be is shaped by these processes fundamentally, a relational ontology. But what I was fascinated about this work, what, what it shared was this emphasis on how we are and who, how we come to be as a species, as a human subjectivity is shaped by our relationships, not just with other humans, but with other life forms and the same for them. And it's this real depth of a sense of interdependency at the heart of Anthropocene idea, which for me is really appealing, which as you would probably guess, if you never heard of it, feminist scholarship, environmental humanities has really been at the forefront of developing. Um, and yeah, post-humanity scholarship is, is one place where that's really happened. And there's an interesting tension there between a kind of always already existing indigenous approach, which is already enlivened by this relational ontology and animism. Uh, and I say tension because there's tension around there about Western scholars discovering some of this indigenous scholarship when it's ongoing already. Would you talk a little bit more about post-humanities and just post-humans? Because I don't think a lot of people know about that either. Yeah, and I'm certainly not an expert. I've kind of cherry-picked the, the bits that I, I want. So uh, uh, in a broader sense, um, it's about, not about after humans so much, but it's a bit like post-modernity and it's like thinking about different ways of engaging with what it means to be human. So if we think about the humanities, forget the post for a minute, and the history of humanities, then what they're basically about is about human culture, human relationships, different human cultures, say, uh, uh, as well. But it's a focus on the human and the uh, uh, anthropocentric, right, by definition. And the post humanities is about saying, in one sense, it's about saying, OK, now we're turning to animals, other species, other forms of life recognizing animal sentience, animal histories, and, and the interdependence and intersection of human animal worlds. We need something more than the humanities, or we need to think about bringing into the humanities our relationships with other species. And we need new theories to do that. We need new methods to do that. We need new ethics to do that, uh, to look at the animal side or, or multi-species relations. And so it's about uh, kind of revisiting all those theories and perspectives in the humanities to do that. There's another side to the post-humanities, which is more about human engagements with kind of technology um, and the non-human in that sense and how that shapes and defines us and changes us, which is, that's the kind of side I've left uh, um, to one side and I'm focused on the kind of um, non-human in, in terms of other species and other forms of life. But, but that's, that's kind of where it, a post-human movement is coming from. It feels a lot like the time of Copernicus, like when we realized we're not the center of the universe, <laughs> but like on another level. <laughs> Beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. You think if you think maybe Freud kind of unseated uh, the rational person at the center of like, like Copernicus and put the irrational self there instead. And that opened all sorts of boxes, didn't it? But this is really decentering the human completely. Exactly. Yeah. I love that analogy. Yeah. It's uh, another Copernican revolution. It really feels like it. It's something that um, that I heard Greta say the other day. I think she was at some talk, but um, she thought, was talking about how, uh, in you know, in general, people feel like you know we can't really do anything to change things on a global level, and it's just kind of playing out, and everything. I, a lot of people feel kind of like everything, kind of on its way already. Um, but she pointed out that we all, we did like shut everything down for coronavirus and like everything really halted, you know, enough to kind of help halt that disaster. 
so that if we really all work together to like halt things again and really treat like the climate crisis as a the emergency that it is that we could actually make a change i hadn't had hope until i heard her say that <laughs> yeah yeah if you, if you're around this kind of stuff and you well if you if you got your eyes open you could say then uh, an ambivalent relationship with hope uh or, yeah, or, or what hope is is it <laughs> Yeah, it, it's tough, isn't it? I was reading something the other day about um, hopeless activism, which I found really interesting, which was uh, about kind of where, what happens when you give up hope, but you've gone through kind of despondency, you know, then then what? And I feel a bit like that just because I've been in, I've just been engaging with this material for so long, you know. But, um, you know, back to Gramsci, wasn't it, who said something like, you know, um, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So, you, you know, we have to recognise that things are in a really precarious situation and there's lots of obstacles, um, powerful obstacles to changing those kinds of things. But, yeah, you're right, there are, there, are, there, are, there are historical precedents, and there's a very recent one, for showing us what we can do, or the level of change that there can be if we work together. And um, I, I, I would say that, in the concepts of COVID, what, what's really interesting about that is zoonosis, so the kind of transmission of disease from humans to animals to humans and back again, is at the heart of it potentially. Uh, and even if it turned out not to be, there's something about the really close proximity of humans and other species that defines how we live today and is part of the problem, isn't it? And we need to revisit and rethink that um, for sure uh, going forward. But yeah, so I think for me, it's always important to search for hope um in the previous book that i published in 2016 i stole a concept of narrative foreclosure from gerontology from aging studies and it was a concept used to describe how in a malaise in later life for older people sometimes where they feel like it's too late to story their own life it's too late to live meaningfully to have narratives narrative foreclosure and i took that and applied it to the kind of dominant narratives we have around climate crisis. And this is before I'd really engaged with the Anthropocene. This sense that, that I feel often in everyday life that we don't really have the kind of alternative stories ready or available um, to help us navigate beyond climate crisis. We kind of have apocalyptic narratives, everything's going to end. We kind of have, don't worry, just carry on as normal and maybe recycle a bit more, which obviously don't match up with the scale of the crisis. And in between that, it just seems to be business as usual. There's a sense of narrative foreclosure. So what again appeals to me about the Anthropocene potentially is like you were saying earlier, it's a really exciting story in a way or a way of narrating our relationship to the world, um, potentially anyway, that could be really productive. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely have an ambivalent relationship with hope also. And what I finally came to after my period of depression <laughs> that uh, I get you know we're still living so while I'm living I'll just try to do my best at least in my corner of the world and like my own situation so look like you know my husband and I just like moved to the countryside and now we've like we're starting a garden and we're gonna start taking like beekeeping classes and like you know learn how to keep bees and we got a little insect hotel and I know it's like very small but at least it feels like more like we're doing something we don't have a car we take trains you know we have to go places and ride a bike or walk and so it feels like at least um we can do that most mostly vegan i was told by a vegan that i can't say i'm vegan if i'm not 100 vegan so i'm mostly vegan <laughs> that, you know? that, ve that vegan is wrong you can call yourself whatever you like vanessa she, she <laughs> yelled at me <laughs> but i mostly i mostly eat vegan um so at least i feel like yeah, even if you can't do it all the way for everything, like doing what you can or doing a percentage of something it still helps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel the same. Or even if it doesn't help in some big scale of things, then it helps It helps us and the people around you to feel like you're trying to live more ethically. We don't have to be grand about that, but it feels like the right thing to do. So we're attached to it, right? I was, I'm on a... Uh, one mailing list where someone sent around something about um, 
a, a writer who'd been around for a long time writing about this stuff and it was quite a short piece and he just said don't bother it's too late basically and some some facts on climate crisis we failed and uh you know it, re it really did get me down for a, a, a day or two uh in amongst it you know once you remind us sometimes it, it can take you that way but then it was really interesting to see some of the other posts that were quite cross with this person uh, saying this is basically a kind of privileged position for someone who might not have caring responsibilities or um, can kind of say that but then carry on their own life. Whereas there's a lot more, there's a lot of affect and emotion around these kinds of statements. And actually we need hope on a level of everyday care and who or what we're responsible for just to keep going. And we are keeping going in that space, you know. Uh, so, yeah, no, I think that sounds, sounds like... Uh, you're doing something meaningful and engaging in your everyday life, right? Which is, what else can we do? Reminds me of, what was it? A book I read when I was young. Voltaire's Candide, right? He went through this horrible life, awful life. And at the end, what does he do to, after, after all the torture and ruin he'd been through? He, he started a garden, he tended a garden and that was about all he could do. But that was, okay, this, this, this is where I am. And this is the difference I can make. Gardens really help. I love our garden. We've only had it for what six weeks now, <laughs> but just like watching things grow and then die, and like it kind of keeps you in the like impermanence of things. It's like, oh, these roses are blooming; they're beautiful, and then like in a week or two, they're gone, and it's just like you keep like working on things, or deadheading, cutting off the deadheads, and just trying to tend to things, even though they're in their cycle of birth and death, and it's not really under our control. But I can like try to help where I can <laughs> yeah we do uh, I work with a, a local group that takes people out into nature for um uh, to help with distress or those kinds of issues another part of my work is around nature connection but I, what I your example there is lovely in that people often think that nature is something completely separate from culture or human culture but actually what i what i've noticed when people spend meaningful time in nature that they find healing is that it's such an amazing source of narrative and metaphor and uh inspiration for for what we would call human culture for the things they do for being creative you know it's it's a a, a constantly replenished source of inspiration but also reflection isn't it and engagement and all these things and as well as being abundantly alive in its own right yeah, while I, while I was moving, I was appropriately re moving from the city to the countryside. I was appropriately reading Walden. <laughs> and I got, I was like, I'm going to turn off everything and not be connected. Of course, I can't do that. I have a job and stuff. But, you know, for a few days, I did. <laughs> How did you get interested in this in the first place? What's your journey kind of been like? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, I was a... I was a first generation university student um, in my family. Um, and when I went away, I lived in a kind of, I suppose you'd now call it a post-industrial town in the north of England, um, pretty grim. But when I moved away, only to the kind of Midlands in, in the UK to study, I was on the edge of the Peak District, which is a beautiful national park in um, the UK. And um, I had a radical education at university, what it turned out to be. Uh, it was an early 90s kind of course which blended Marxism and psychoanalysis and uh, critical theory. And uh, again, it blew my mind. But at the same time, I was also spending a lot of time with friends in the countryside for the first time in my life. And um, I really developed a sense of deep sense of attachment to that place and being outside, being with others outside. Um, that time too and I think in my as I became an academic myself although it was dormant for a while that's that the learning I did then and being in nature were kind of fused somehow and um, it was only after I've been increasingly specialized within social science which tends to happen as an academic I was focusing on identity theories relational ontology but focusing in more and more and more when um, I had a moment where I went to a lecture uh, sorry a conference and it was a one of my old lecturers was giving a lecture on um, nature, capitalism and the psyche, I think. And I, I'd forgotten about him and this course. And that just there and then after listening to this talk, I just thought I, I'm, I've, got to, I've got to engage with this stuff again. I've got to connect with an understanding of nature, uh, politics, psychology. 
if I'm going to do anything, not that, I'm th- not that I suddenly thought I was going to make an amazing difference, but I thought if I'm going to spend my time doing this, I have to re-engage with all this. And, and, and then I start to see those connections again. And um, yeah, since then, I suppose I've, this is probably 10 years ago, I've just focused much more, well, exclusively on our relationships with the non-human yeah, it, there's so many books on like capitalism and psychology, capitalism, psychoanalysis, politics, and psychoanalysis, but not with nature included in. And that now that we're talking about it, it's really kind of mind boggling. It's like, how, how, how did humans develop in the first place that we feel so disconnected from our environment and to the point where we were like destroying it? Like most animals don't destroy their habitat. <laughs> Yeah, and that's where I think you need. That's where I think interdisciplinarity is absolutely key. So you can't you can't approach it only as a social scientist because it involves deep time and and you know geology. But you can't approach it only as geologist because you need psychoanalysis to understand this kind of cultural pathology or, or malaise that that allows us to, to to maintain kind of defense mechanisms that don't uh, fully notice or at least recognize that what we're doing uh, or some of us are doing uh, in some you know in some parts of the world to the planet yeah I, I i'm constantly amazed at the strong denial mechanism that humans have <laughs> we're like it's really strong <laughs> yeah and i, th- I think uh, psychodynamic approaches and a couple of others are really they it's been intriguing for me how well they fit. You know, it's like, uh, I love some psychodynamic theory and I love some social psychology. It's uh, around th- this theory called terror management theory, which is existentialism. But they've got really well-developed theories about how defense mechanisms work, not applied to climate crisis or Anthropocene. But then they just box ready. You know, they just, they're just, it's like, oh my God, yeah, this is exactly what people do or what businesses do or what, how discourses work to stop us well we know of course we know but but also not know about what's happening you know when we're encouraged to do that culturally politically as much as we engage in these mechanisms individually don't you think i mean it's it's kind of a, a canonical cultural narrative that encourages to not take these things these things seriously even at the same time as saying we need to take these things very seriously no absolutely and i can't help but see culture and politics and, and humanity as like a large scale uh, human mind because like in psychoanalytic training they taught us like over and over again you can't apply these principles of like individuals to society and like you can't apply this to politics and I was like okay okay I just took that in because that's what the teachers were saying and then I got a little older and I was like what are you talking about like this is so clearly like similar like it's us still why would we not do that it just it makes no sense to me to not do that it seems so clear yeah so, so one of my one of the earliest people I came across undergraduate degree actually I think was Christopher Lash and um, his take on kind of narcissism as a cultural pathology which now we can now I, I probably have various problems with but you know again I was um, totally bowled over by this the use of psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic theory to what, what it felt like at the time to really nail what was going on in broader kind of capitalist culture, but not out there, as you said, kind of in terms of how we end up making sense of ourselves as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and critical, of course, you know, the Frankfurt School and uh, we were another group I learned about way back then who had also kind of taken psychoanalytic theory and really thought it was a useful tool, didn't they, for making sense of what they were discovering as the nature of capitalism in America. Yeah, exactly. And I think Freud, I mean, Freud was applying things to society too. So I don't know where it happened along the way that it became something not to do, maybe because of World War II and people not wanting to be political because you could, you could get you killed, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know enough about Freud. I know about things like civilization and discontents, but yeah, that's interesting. So you think that that was there, it was there to be taken on, but it, it was kind of neglected until, or, or marginalized um, aspect of his work. 
Yeah, I think so. And I think it's coming back up uh, again recently because in the beginning, Freud, somebody wrote yeah. a book about um, Freud's free clinics a few years back and how Freud had originally imagined kind of psychoanalysis for all and like wanting to set up these kind of clinics where people could get psychoanalysis for free. Um, so he initially had like this idea for it to be something to help the greater community. And then it just kind of became more narrow and narrow and narrow over time. Mm. Yeah, certainly not what that's fascinating. That's not what I associate with Freud as this kind of more ideal, like, I don't know, like Lang or antipsychiatry, you know, that, uh, that kind of model. But yeah, I never knew. Mm -hmm. I know. I think it had been hidden. And I think also a lot of, at least in the States, you know, a lot of people who had to flee to the States because of World War II of being becoming, you know, political prisoners or being killed. So I think maybe maybe it kind of became part of the psychoanalytic culture to like avoid those topics to kind of keep yourself and you know try to stay out of harm's way maybe. Mm. Yeah. So what else are you working on? Um, yeah. So uh, I guess there are a few kind of offshoots from the book. I'm kind of I want to carry on working on. Anthropocene psychology ideas. So in the in the book, I took an, a number of little stories, I suppose, to start off each chapter. And um, as is often the case with me, I, I, I get carried away by my inclinations rather than any expertise. But um, the, probably most of those chapters, I've got projects that I'm kind of starting to spin the plate on or trying to keep the plate spinning now. So the first chapter in the book, I focus on uh, you've heard of Ivan Pavlov, uh, the Russian physiologist turned psychologist, right? And everyone knows he experimented with dogs, don't they, more or less, I think. Mm -hmm. And the kind of stimulus response experiments and um, salivating to a bell or, you know, it kind of resonates in popular culture. But for this, for that first chapter, what I intended to do was just say, right, come on, psychologists, you can engage with uh, post-humanities and so on. And I'm going to use this case study. What do you know about Pavlov's dogs? Uh, same as me, probably, what we learned from textbooks and so on. They were kind of docile objects, interchangeable things. We don't really need to pay much attention to them as things. It's more about them as proxies for human learning or you know, the, the start of behaviorism as a, 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 as a perspective. Anyway, I didn't dig very far. I was just going to look at a few examples of experimental animals in psychology as a way to think about human animal relations in a slightly different way, rather than just as uh, scientific observers of things. But the, as soon as I started to dig into Pavlov's life, it was just like, oh, my God. What, why do we not know about any of this? For a start, his life, his life itself is unbelievable. I mean, he was, he was persecuted um, by uh, uh, Stalin's regime, but he was an anti-Semite anti himself. He was an authoritarian, all sorts. But also his dogs. Thousands and thousands of dogs passed through his experimental laboratories. Um, so uh, they... 50 plus year career and what he did to those dogs was sometimes barbaric right so there's a story there and part of that story is isn't this horrific psychologists we need to face up to our past and acknowledge this as part of our uh, traditions but much so much more than that as well Vanessa I was finding he also loved his dogs and cared for them they were given names um, I found a list of names and put that into a paper so I'm trying to collect as many names as I can um, they had lives, you know, of course. The relationships with the experimenters were really complex because they grew attached to them. Um, and also, another really interesting facet for me is that lots of results were hidden because the dogs were actually really lively characters uh, who didn't respond to experiments in the way that we think. There were no hard set laws um, because they were just too unpredictable uh, and individual characters. And that was hidden at the time and it still is. So. Anyway, I've written about this to some extent already. What I, what I really want to do is develop, um, anyway, I want to develop my work with artists and work with artists. We were talking earlier, weren't we, about kind of hope. And um, for me, it's partly about keeping myself uh, engaged in projects um, that are meaningful. And I love the idea of taking Pavlov's laboratories 
as places. Now I know something about them and turning them into a kind of diorama, like a, a, a small miniature scale models and, and really open them up, the interiors and the exteriors as an art installation. Take some artistic license, license, experiment with them, but really give a sense of what was going on there. Not just time, not just in terms of the horrors, but also in terms of a really complex human animal relational dynamic, um, uh, uncanny, slightly bizarre thing that we think of now as a psychology experiment. So, yeah, I'm working with a model maker at the moment to try and get some funding to do that. And um, yeah, I'm just convinced there's a real story there to tell a real narrative. So that's something I really want to develop. And as I say, that just comes out the first chapter of the book. So um, it's trying to find ways to creatively engage with this relational ontology I'm talking about, you know, to unpack something like animal experimentation as actually a, a really complex relation between different sentient beings. I love that. And I love that you're turning towards the arts and I remember when I first learned that, like, when they say, like, oh, he, the dog salivated with the bell or whatever, but, like, really, he was, like, drilling holes into their jaw or something to collect the saliva. It wasn't like, like, they just noticed the dog salivating, <laughs> like, a little more uh, real than that. And I feel like, I feel like so much of what we know are these, like, little memes, you know, of, like, th these huge stories and these things that are really complex and interesting, like, wh where we've moved to is uh, the town where the woman, Astrid Lindgren, who wrote Pippi Longstocking is from. And so oh, yeah. it's like Pippi Longstocking and there's like Pippi Longstocking, Astrid Lindgren's world down the street and things like that. So it's a really cute like storybook town. Um, but I recently got her war journals and um, she was like, she worked in an office. It was a housewife, she had two children. She never thought of being an author. And she was in Sweden, like seeing the World War II, you know, starting to happen around her. And they're like, from 1939 1945 or something and after a few years of like like watching witnessing this kind of devastation grow more and more she started making up these stories to tell to her children as bedtime stories and that's where Pippi Longstocking came from but it's like nobody knows that you know it's like oh Pippi Longstocking is so cute but like whenever you look into anything there's like such a deeper story to it than than we realize everything's just been turned into these like cute little packages that people just in jest, but we don't really know where it comes from. Yeah. I, I used to read Klaus on the Roof, the Klaus books to my kids by um, her. Yeah, I never knew anything about her, but I thought she was a brilliant writer. She's really great. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you're there. We all, in fact, we considered at one point they were so into the books, my two daughters, two, two youngest, that uh, we actually considered visiting a museum. There is a museum there, right, that's dedicated to her, I think, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. they have a childhood home as a museum and they have to be long stocking or actually in the world and the funny thing is, is they have like a whole miniature of the old town of the town like in the pippy long stocking world that's what i call no. it language world um and in and our house is in the old town and so there's like a little miniature house of ours which is no way it's really weird yeah we have a we have there's a our house has like a little cottage um, and it's rented out to two guys who are actors in Esther Lindgren's world. And so when we first moved here, like literally the day after, they were having the dress rehearsal because it's basically all of her stories. It's like basically musical theater. So it's an outdoor theme park, but it's not like Disney where there's like rides. Instead, it's like musical theater scenes. So these yeah. actors act out scenes from the different stories in her book and there's different lands for the different stories like where they were held. And it's actually really, really good. It's really good acting, really good sets and everything. Um, and the the couple that's here in our in our cottage, they brought us there for the day that's like the dress rehearsals that they could bring friends and family before the park actually opened. Um, so we got to go and see everything like with no one else there. And they were like, oh, you have to come and see your house. And we were like, what? <laughs> and then like, they walked us into the little town and there's like this little house that's our house, but not. Because apparently it's from a story, there's Emil of Lonenberia and uh, Emil like gets on a horse. He's like a mischievous kid and he gets on a horse and like rides into the mayor's house and like crashes their, his dinner party and like all the food flies everywhere and a pie goes in the mayor's face, like, <laughs> like that. And apparently that scene took place like in our house 
No way. <laughs> so, so like you open up the house, the miniature of our house in the in the land, and there's like a little scene from the story in there. Yeah, it was pretty weird. I was like, yeah, it was very psychedelic. Yeah. <laughs> I get a house and then find out there's a miniature of your house. Somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's quite unique, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, and we yeah. had no idea. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean. Obviously, from what I've been saying, you probably tell I've got a fascination with um, kind of those model villages or those, those dioramas. You know, they kind of feel like a in the UK concept, like a big, almost a Victorian type uh, leisure pursuit. But yeah, that is that is wow. That's that is uncanny. I want it's is pretty there wild. A, <laughs> is there a model village inside the model village with the you know with the <laughs> with the, another one inside? Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, what you're saying. So yeah, I think you're right. There is there is always often amazing stories behind the little memes we told, and I think that's one of the real privileges of being afforded any time to write. And I do do kind of empirical research as part of my job, and go and talk to people or do research. But also a lot of it is desk based research. You know, um, researching things, uh, reading, and through the computer. And yeah, one of those the great privilege is, is having the time to discover the stories behind like I say I follow my own uh, luckiness to be able to follow my inclination a lot the stories behind the post-humanities and a few cases within there and then you dig deep and it's like wow you know uh, and then it's about your ability to tell that story or or engage with it uh, that you worry about once you know there's a story there that's just like yes great yeah, and also seeing it from a different perspective, right? From this point in time rather than the time it was happening um, with our cultural lens. Yeah. Yeah, and that can be, a, a, as a writer and researcher, that's really affirming in a way, isn't it? Because these things in the abstract, the psych yeah, human-animal relations really matter. We need to address these. We tend to ignore um, animals or not pay attention to their uh inner lives or their reality okay fair enough in the abstract then you find a story like this like you said receive wisdom is and it's like oh my god this is this actually is true because it, it really resonates and when you can attach it to a specific case study and uh there is an accepted veneer or i should say a meme about what these dogs did or what their lives were about what their role was yeah make past that dogs come to life yeah I also, I tend to go, like, my first, the first conference I co-hosted with my friend Lanya Senko in New York was on psychoanalysis and violence and problems of systemic violence and mental health and, and in America, and that was in 2015. And then after that, you know, it's really intense to be studying all of that, um, like, 24-7 for a year to put that conference together. And so then after that, all I wanted to do was, like, make art and do art. So then after that, I made that conference on psychoanalysis and art and magic <laughs> I was like I, I'm just gonna have fun but it also I, that also happened because I felt like after having this whole conference that's something that I was really like I had been working in the American hospital system and just seeing how horribly my patients were treated and when I left I was really like wanted to show people like what was going on so I was like, trying to make this big event like to kind of show analyst what was going on and then I realized like all the analysts that come to conferences are like academics and people in their offices on the Upper East Side that haven't seen uh the kind of horrors of the hospital system in, in certain ways and I just felt like I was like talking to a wall like I didn't feel like it went anywhere everyone was just like oh okay that's interesting and like nodding and I was like this is this isn't helping and I was like well I'm just gonna start talking about art because they feel like art art always can say something before everyone else says it it's like artists have this sort of liminal space or like free path to kind of like go where other people aren't going quite yet um so I was like let's just talk about art and magic and like making things happen yeah I totally agree I mean that's yeah I totally agree it really resonates with me especially presenting some of this stuff at psychology conferences or even social psychology conferences I'm trying to talk about, uh, or even social science, when you say, picking up on other people's work, not my idea, that, you know, another chapter in the book is about meat and um, talking about the kind of scale of institutionalised violence um, towards other animals 
if we try and think about that, the scale that that's happening, we, sh we should think about it as a kind of sociology as a violence topic at the very least. Um, and certainly in psychology, we should be thinking about what, what processes allow us to eat meat. Um, again, not necessarily pejorative, but we, how do we understand this on this scale? But it, exactly, it feels like this, it feels like that's interesting. Um, anyway, back to the other stuff that we do tend to, think, to focus on and talk about and think about unless you're in those specialists with those specialist groups who already know this and already agree and, you know, so on and so forth. But I, it absolutely resonates with me what you say about art is that space and writing as well, fiction, where you can do some of this and it, people will be more receptive or, or, or engage with that. I think, um, yeah, absolutely. There's, so in terms of me, the kind of disclosure of violence, which is often a, obviously a key strategy for animal rights groups is I totally understand we need to, to, to kind of disclose that syst systemic violence but we, again we, we have defense mechanisms right that we can engage in that, that that just mean we can shut that off so yeah I'm just really interested in work that engages creatively with this um, idea and again another chapter actually was about trying to be more creative and there's a documentary I don't know if you've seen it in the UK called Carnage which was actually made by the BBC and I won't go into the detail of it, but it was a really fascinating attempt to present a utopia. 50 years from now, so 2000, maybe 2017, 2067, we live in a vegan utopia. And, uh, but it was a comedy, a mockumentary. But what it, what it was really clever at doing was from this far future or near future point, it, the way that the documentary mockumentary worked was it in, incorporated footage from the post 1950s onwards of animal slaughter so quite some of it quite grim um, but also advertising and practices like eating burgers um, and a few historical moments in the UK but by setting in this future where animals were now free and there's more to it it really framed normal practices as we were just talking about kind of memes that we might take for granted as obscene and it really worked didn't matter whether you're vegan or not, or just for that moment, you know, it really did cast them in a different light. And I thought this is as a potential methodology, you know, kind of constructing alternative futures and using them to look back. Really fascinating way and more powerful in many ways, certainly, than just disclosing violence in isolation. So, again, yeah, a really good example. Of not only is art sometimes that liminal space is, is better, it's actually ahead of any, it's doing it before academics get there as well. It's just that... Uh, it's not articulated in, in the same ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I found that I, my recent book was called uh, Scansion in Psychoanalysis and Art, and I basically used different artists over time to talk about different, like, analytic concepts. Um, and, yeah, like, artists for sure, like, people were doing gender-bending artworks in, like, the 1960s and way before Judith Butler and, and her uh, gender theory, you know, so it's like, uh, it's always in practice. It's always in practice before we start naming it, I guess, and conceptualizing it. Um, absolutely. That sounds interesting. I have to watch that. I also feel like when people are watching art or they've chosen to participate in art in some way, that they feel like they're less defensive in a way. Like they don't have their like <laughs> academic or the day-to-day -day hat on. They've like decided to go into this other experience. So maybe it's able to have more of an impact. And sometimes like, like I've had to mute a lot of people on Twitter, for example, that are like animal rights activists, even though I want to like support them. So I want to like their work, but I can't look at it because of the like lots of posting of like animals being slaughtered and stuff. And it's just like, I'm in the middle of my day and just getting like shocked by these things. And I just, I can't handle it. You know, I don't want it. I don't want to look at it all the time randomly when I don't know it's going to pop up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. For that reason the same i don't know yeah I, i'm ambivalent about tactics i suppose as a, a what, what did you call yourself a, a trying to be vegan yeah i think i'm a i, I call myself <laughs> a rubbish vegan i'm a vegan but i fail you know uh, um even yeah i find i'm not sure about it's necessary you know, we need that but there are connect we need to, we need to, we need to get you need to engage with people in a way that makes them want to rethink animal sentience not just to club them over the head and tell them they're wrong in what they do already right it's 
So there are obviously different strategies, but for me, it comes back to this idea of an invitation, you know, invitation that narrative stories art to just shift one's perspective a little bit. Maybe that's not ambitious enough, but, you know, it's finding ways to do that is uh, something. Yeah. And also, yeah, using psychology in that way, like trying to like present things in a way that people won't get so defensive. Um, even though people do need to be aware of how horrific their conditions are, especially like in the U.S., where like it's like ninety percent, ninety-nine percent of the farming is like these factory farms, where all the animals are like in these horrible shelters and stuff. You know, here in Sweden, I don't know what it's like overall, but when we like are on the bus going around from town to town, you can see the cows walking around and the little red barns and stuff. And so it appears to be that there are farmers where animals live outside, like sheep and cows and stuff. Um, I haven't seen any like factory farming or anything. I'm, I don't know, it might be somewhere, but at least there are like other kinds of old school farms too. <laughs> um, but yeah. in the States, I feel like they've really like bowled over all of the like old school farmers and just like made these big factory farms. Yeah, out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. I, 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 one of my heroes in recent years has been Donna Haraway, her writing um a kind of feminist philosopher but she's also really engaged with the kind of animal turn and post-humanities but she's got a really interesting take on veganism and um which some vegan activists really disagree with um which is that we cannot she cannot fully embrace ethical veganism i think i might be doing a position disservice here but she says that fundamentally our relationship to other animals, we have to acknowledge that it might involve killing. And um, she says that not to acknowledge that is to kind of ride roughshod over generations of, of livestock farmers who, uh, you know, for instance, who have a relationship with animals that we might understand other cultures and that accepting this possibility of killing and being killed because we also die uh, is, is necessary and we cannot avoid that. Um, yeah, I've got some sympathy with that view, even though I am trying to be a vegan, you know, it, for me, it's, it, there is real complexity there in our relationship to other animals. And sometimes it might involve violence, which, you know, I feel it feels hard to say that, but it might. Whereas I've, for me, there's absolutely, I've got no problem with saying factory farming is just wrong. You know, I mean, it's just the, the treatment of animals in that context is um, indefensible and, you um, that's where our meat comes from so you know it's a no-brainer in that sense and not just meat but byproducts mm -hmm. absolutely but like also like like i live in sweden and it's cold and so like i have like a wolf sweater and then i that, that's actually what happened when i was told i wasn't allowed to be called vegan because i had a wolf sweater but it's really cold and the person who told me that was visiting and was super vegan and would not wear anything like that but instead they're wearing like plastic made like synthetic fibers you know so it's like synthetic mm -hmm. fibers any better i don't know <laughs> it just seems it's complicated <laughs> exactly yeah and you have to find your own way without being harsh with others you know i think for me anyway because um you know that, that that that's just the way it is you can't avoid it anyway if you start thinking you can then you're gonna that, then you're then yeah you can't whenever i tell people are vegan now which of course is what vegans always do then uh, it's, uh what i've noticed is really interesting is what the, the first thing they often do is tell you how little meat they eat or when they do or don't eat meat which i find again not just mental is really interesting i think everyone wants to find some kind of balance and becoming aware of these issues and you know it's, uh, and shares the same values to some extent it's just there's it's just so complicated you know and there are so many so many practices bound up in meat eating in our culture and so on that it's not just about an individual saying i'm not going to do any of this anymore you can't opt out that easily yeah and that's another thing though that greta said in this recent documentary is that uh, they showed like how much the, the farming it has an impact on the earth with um like how much land it takes up and like how many how many more acres they have to take up to make the feed for the animals if you just like eat the grains instead of eating the animals you know we would be wasting a lot less land that's sort of practical thing but at the same time like if i'm at somebody's house like my husband's aunt's house or something and she makes fish i just eat the fish i'm not gonna not eat her food because i just i just can't do that 
So I just think it's an individual. Everyone should try and do what they feel best for themselves. Yeah. And also, I can't, I'm also like, this is my analytic position again, though. I also like can't tell other people what to do, you know? Mm-hmm. It's just, like do what I do for me. And then like you think about the way you want and do what you want. <laughs> yeah. <can't>. yeah. <laughs> I agree. I feel that deeply, which me- ends up me- meaning you, yeah, can make it difficult when you might feel like you should be an activist about certain things. But for me, that always trumps it. You know, uh, for me personally, it's like, no, I can't, you know, who am I to tell anyone else what to do? And I often say that almost apologetically. If you start talking about something like veganism again, I don't know if that's the best way, but it's like, no, I'm, this is what I feel like I should do. It's not, a, it's not a comment on what I think you should do. Uh, even though at the same time, analytically, I'm looking at institutionalized violence and so on. I still feel that yeah, really um, powerfully as a, as a thing for the way I can, op- the only way I can operate, yeah. Yeah, oh, I feel like imposing your views too strongly on other people is violent in itself, you know, and that it also, it doesn't work as well because also from being a therapist, like people have to come to things on their own and like decide things for, for themselves. And you can't like just say, like if you t- like that's why I don't give a lot of advice, you know, like you tell someone, oh, well, you should go do this. It will always backfire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if that's what they would have decided to do on their own, you know, yes. they decide to do it on their own, it could work. But if I tell them to do that, then it's gonna not work just in in that like oppositional stance of like showing that it didn't work. So just what people do. <laughs> yeah. It's just our nature. So yeah. so we're more oppositional, I think, than we realize. So yeah. it's better to just like lay off, lead by example. If you feel like thinking of it that way, like be an example, be the change you want to see in the world, you know, and then yeah. just like let people decide on their own individuals. Yeah. Of course, then fighting the systems is a different thing. Yes, it is. Yes. But again, that's that's that leading by example there is activism that isn't, you know, you're not trying to get other people to be activists with you necessarily are you so that's still yeah no I agree humility for me trumps everything else so yeah yeah um don't know how we got to this but where where, where were we Uh, it happens when you don't have a plan (laughs) oh yeah yeah so (laughs) there I think we did the other thing I've been doing is um going out onto the downs which is my local countryside i suppose and um interviewing what we call lookerers which are voluntary shepherds uh i was really interested working with a sociologist here at brighton to just get a sense of how those interactions worked you know people another human animal relationship these volunteers who go out every day and tend the sheep on the urban fringes of my city brighton and uh, yeah that's something else i'd like to do more of those kinds of see where those relationships are happening, those kind of interactions and see what people get out of it. And also try and bring the sheep into the research this is where I think art and different practices would be more useful because um, academic methodologies struggle to get at the animal side of these kinds of relationships. We just focus on the human, we interview them all. Um, so we need kind of sheep scientists or and artists or others to, to, uh, to get involved. But yeah, I'm really interested to see how people's perspectives change, if at all, when they have this kind of routine contact, which we regularly denied with sometimes the animals we eat or the animals that are in our culture represented in particular ways. So again, I've written about this already, but this is something I'd like to develop more. Gets me, allows me to be outside while I do research as well, which I always like. This is really nice. I will link to all these things um, so that people can find them, find your books and find your work. Um, Thanks. Is there anything else that you wanted to be sure to mention before we wrap up? No, that's it. It's been a real, it's, it's been a, a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Matt Adams. Check out his book, Anthropocene Psychology, Being Human in a More Than Human World, from Rutledge, 2020. Links to his books and articles can be found in the text accompanying this episode. 
You can follow him at Twitter at MattAdams0. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. For more information, you can visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, and sign up for my newsletter on the contact page to stay abreast of all upcoming events. You can also visit the Rendering Unconscious main website, renderingunconscious.org. And follow me at Instagram and Twitter at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore. Thank you so much for listening to Rendering Unconscious Podcast and for your support. You can support the podcast at our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. Your support is so appreciated. Thank you so much to all of our Patreon patrons. Waiting, waiting, waiting. When I into number nine nine. of the or the less entire entire. typewriter mimic disaster. Opening chapter. Opening chapter. The writing machine. The writing like machine. those of a like those do of it a yourself. Do it Fear of restrooms. Is to life. Head slightly. He is. In the past, yes. the senses was the tear vile. Perception as the painter's technique. In his powers. Swinging power. back society to close. Satan, Satan glued Satan. into your. I dare you. Into me. I know you. Joint know efforts. You. Pray. Originally ground, almost signal, backwards on my idea of regression, of brainstorming, in his powers, might be, might be. Europe and North America, we but may. allowed for contact we between, we may. defining data as its we resistance may. to definition, new dimension, might be, we may, gambling scenes, but it is, but it is. New dimension, light my, light my fire, light my fire. unconsciously, after all, forces, after all. One. As, one. as discussed, one. just smart, sickly thing to mend, resting, cut. resting. waiting, the grand highway, once, thus bringing his work, his work. the data is allowed for, opening chapter, opening chapter. Constant internal observations head, and head slightly waiting head slightly provided and their provided. intersection new forms the particles relationships in 1913 to sound despite that lead sight and then he would turn his the daughter the data is allowed for organism in dreams I talk with you sexuality in your dreams last physical love V into Constant internal with all the tentacles observation the people who particles the daughter tentacles movement is itself kinesthetic of the got my into number nine light my fire typewriter mimic swinging back sickly thin in the past was the tear vial to mend the painter's technique is the cut opening chapter unconsciously organism from the every level inherit business of life sexuality and computer does when I into number nine of the specializes the entire the inherent nature of words disaster has discussed close Cut up forces Safe. is the cut. I dare you. Sickly thin. I know you. Against the rock. 
clarifies their formal debate as to the exact now is blessed backwards on my idea of regression he would turn his in his powers in dreams pray I talk with you almost in your dreams last into me the into joint efforts and then new dimension despite Vanessa but there is uh, there is uh